Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced his crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wonder from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save that person from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Evan Moore, Evan Moore. Good work, buddy. Thanks for sharing the Word of God with us, hiding it in your heart. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage to stand up and recite for memory eight verses to like a whole room of people. So, man, really proud of you. Good, good job. Hey, welcome to City Light Church. This is our Sunday morning gathering. We scatter as a church throughout the week, and we gather on Sunday mornings to worship Jesus, hear from His Word. And uh, so good to have you guys with us this morning. Would you please open your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 13. We're going to read and study the last eight verses. This is week 10 in our last week in our study of the New Testament book of James. I'm out of breath because I ran to the front of the room, realizing I was preaching after that song. So <clears throat> pardon me as I gather myself. Uh, now, let me say, James has been an incredible book. Uh, James is a book of action. It's a book all about doing, and I think it's really been received well by our church, primarily because for 18 months as a church, we have just beat the good news of the gospel into our heads and hearts. And so you guys hear every week, it's not about what you do, but what Jesus has done that makes you right with God. And so doing has almost become a bad word, right? It's all about what Jesus has done done. And James has been welcomed because finally we get to hear, in light of what Jesus has done for us, what are we to do? And so James is a very practical book. It's a very action-oriented book. And as a congregation that's predominantly Midwestern Americans who are hardworking doers, who are no more than three generations removed from the farm, we are doers, right? We eat guilt for breakfast and work all day to prove our worth. That's the way we do life. And so we love this book about doing. And today we're going to read the last eight verses. And the author, Pastor James, who has been writing to a number of churches that he helps to pastor, uh, you know, we often save the best for last. And we're going to get to read what did Pastor James save for last as he's writing this book all about doing. Is he going to say, now go and um, take the gospel to the nations, go and read your Bible more, go and do this. And what we're going to read is that what he says to do is to pray. It's to pray. The most important thing we can do is to be dependent and to pray. I want to preach a sermon this morning called Praying, uh, Praying Faith. Praying Faith. And um, I want you to know that James is not speaking just some like good old country religious Christian sentiment, right? Like, you just need to pray, brother. Just take it to the Lord. The good Lord wants to hear your prayers, you know? Uh, he's speaking as a man of prayer. James was a man of God who grew up watching his older half-brother Jesus pray. Frequently, Jesus would leave the crowds. He would get alone with God the Father, and he would pray. And James, in his own life, was a man of prayer. Every day, he would spend time literally on his knees praying to God, so much so that history holds that he was nicknamed Old Camel Knees. All right? That doesn't sound like a compliment, but it's a compliment. Old camel knees. His knees were literally prematurely aged, calloused, and wrinkled because of the hours he spent on his knees devoted to prayer. And as a man of prayer, he is speaking into the church and into you and to me that we would pray, that we would be a dependent people. And uh, every week in my sermon prep, it's kind of part study and part, I start praying into our church, like, God, would you take this living word and use it to shape us? And the thing I have been praying in preparation of this morning is that God would use his living word to make us a praying people, 
that we would be a dependent people, that we wouldn't just be um, a good church with good gospel theology and fun community, but that we would have authentic and deep community with God in prayer, that we would be a people that knows how to pray, that knows how to hear from God, that knows how to speak to God, that knows how to pray. And so that's where we're headed this morning. Um, in our last eight verses, James is, uh, he just lays out a number of different scenarios in which we should pray. And for that reason, I'm not going to give a typical three points in a poem kind of Baptist sermon. I just want to walk us through the verses, okay? And so the best way to kind of engage in this morning's sermon, Bible in one hand, notes in the other, we're going to chug through it. If you forgot your Bible, there's grace for that, just barely. Bring it next week. But uh, we'll also have it up on the screens. And so let's get right into it. Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Okay, the verse scenario. Let's stop there. When should we pray? Number one, is anyone suffering? Does this apply to us? Is anyone here suffering? Unfortunately, this is maybe the most easy one to apply, right? Every one of us can think of something, some category of life in which we are struggling, we are suffering in. Literally, the Greek word for suffering there is very generic. It's a very generic term. Uh, he's talking about when things are hard, when life is messy, when things are difficult, complicated, and rough. And I want to say, he says to pray, and the reason why he says to pray is because our natural sinful inclination is to do anything but pray. I would propose that rather than pray, our proclivity is either to do one of two things. We either tend to hide from our problems or we magnify our problems, right? We either run from our problems or we let our problems consume us and overwhelm us, right? And so one way we tend to run from our problems is from self-medicating. When there's problems, some of us will turn to alcohol, a couple drinks every night to just kind of numb the feeling. Some of us will self-medicate with shopping, something to get our head off of the problem that we're facing. Some of us will spend hours on Zillow. Any Zillow fans out there? We're not even buying a house. I like to look at Zillow. You're looking for that dream home. It's something to take your mind away. Some go to the shopping mall to look at things they can't afford and don't need, and it's a form of self-medicating. We tend to be caught up in TV shows, TV series, entertainment, watching the same Sports Center highlight reels over and over and over again. You've already seen the catch, but you're addicted to it because you're running from the infertility, the infidelity, the underemployment, the unemployment, the family drama, the divorce, the pending divorce. Whatever it is, we tend to want to run from our problems or we will be consumed by our problems, right? We don't just run from it. We let it dominate. It is the defining thing of our whole essence, this burden that we are carrying. We let it dominate every thought that we have, every emotion that we have. It, it clouds every relationship and how we relate to other people. And we let it dominate us to the point that we wake or we lay awake in bed at night thinking about our problem. But what James says is don't run from your problem. Don't be consumed by your problem, but run with your problem to God. He says, run. Are any of you suffering? Then pray. Take what you're suffering with and run to God. I want you to see how the gospel frees us to do this. The gospel frees us to run with our suffering to the God who suffered for us. Amen? Isaiah 53 called Jesus a man of sorrows. It says he was acquainted with grief. The book of Hebrews says that we have a high priest who is not unable to sympathize. He knows your suffering. He bore your suffering, your ultimate suffering, the suffering for your sins on the cross. He is a man of sorrows. When your faith is in him, he takes on the burden of your sin suffering and walks with you through the suffering that you experience through life. And he is near. He is available He's not aloof. He's not unable to understand what you're going through. Because God became human in the person of Jesus, he understands. He faced every temptation that you do, but without sin. He understood abandonment, despair, isolation, conflict, haters, financial stress. He knows. He's been there, and he's with you. And he says, are you suffering? Pray. Second half of verse 13, he says this. Is anyone among you, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Okay, so sometimes we're suffering, right? Uh, the gospel relationship with God doesn't alleviate all of our problems. Sometimes we still suffer, but we suffer with Jesus. But so too, sometimes we're happy. 
Amen? And it's good to be happy. I think that the Bible says that we can be cheerful because we realize that Jesus is with us. And let me just, I, this is going to sound funny. I want to give our church permission to be cheerful, okay? We can be happy. We can be cheerful. I think that cheerfulness and happiness has largely fallen out of fashion. It's fallen out of style in evangelicalism. Um, I have a couple of theories on why that is, but one is I think in some ways we have overreacted to an evangelicalism of 10, 15, 20 years ago, which the only emotion it knew how to express itself in was in happiness, right? There was no category if you're a Christian for suffering. And we've all met hyper happy Hank. You know hyper happy Hank? Well, the good Lord saved me and I'm just happy all the time about all things. And if you're not happy, well, you need to get yourself right with the good Lord because the good Lord's gonna make you all happy all the time. Blah, right? And, ugh. <laughs> and what we've tended to do is become hyper allergic to anything that reeks of Christian cheese, right? It's like, oh, so inauthentic, you know? So my parents' generation. I think it's no longer hip to be happy. What's fallen into fashion is this kind of angry evangelicalism, right? Where we wear plaid shirts and smoke cigarettes and craft beers and we listen to emo, depressing movies, and we're just so authentic. You know, our parents were so fake, but we're real. Let's drink a beer and be angry at the church. Hallelujah, you know? And I think what that is is an immature overreaction uh, to this perceived inauthentic um, fake joyfulness. But what does verse 13 says? It says, is anyone cheerful? Yes. And we should sing praise. We can be happy. It's okay to be cheerful. Yes, we don't need to be happy and fake it all the time, but also listen. If you realize that you were once dead in your sin, and God has reached out of the depths of eternity to come in the person and work of Jesus to save you, that should put a smile on your face every now and then. Amen? Amen. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to be joyful. And he says, if any of you has cheer, if any of you has happiness, let him sing praise, right? Sometimes we're happy just because we know God loves us. What do we do with that cheer? We sing praise. God, thank you. You are good. Sometimes we're happy because of our circumstances. That's okay. Not everyone is going through infidelity, right? Not everyone is going through infertility. Don't feel bad if things are going well. Instead, sing praise. You're pregnant? Thank God. Praise him, right? You become a grandparent? Thank God. Praise him. You get a promotion? You get a raise, celebrate that. Praise God. Chris finally gets his lake house. Yes. Uh, turn that into praise of God. That might be idolatrous. We'll work through that this week. But good things happen. It's okay. We can be happy. But James chapter 1 says, every good and perfect gift comes from where? From above, from the Father of lights. And so we don't worship the gift. We worship the gift giver. And when good things are happening, when we're cheerful, we sing praise to God. We say, thank you. God, I'm happy, and I worship you. You're kind. That came from you. Verse 14, he moves on and transitions. He says this, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. You catch the theme of prayer here? Is anyone suffering? Pray. Anyone happy? Pray. Anyone sick? Call for the leaders of the church, have them anoint you with oil, and pray over you. What Paul is saying here is this. When you are sick, it's not just that you are a sick individual. It's that you are a sick member of the body of Christ. And God doesn't want you to go through your sickness in isolation. Because, see, the church cares about you. They depend on you, and you depend on the church. And the leaders of the church want to know that you're sick. Why? So that they can pray for you. And it says that the elders are to anoint you with oil. Does that freak anyone out here? We name the elephant in the room. That's kind of weird in our cultural context. We think anoint with oil. You know, I had acne in high school. I still wash my face twice a day to avoid zits, and I'm 32. So I'm thinking, I don't want oil anywhere near my head, okay? That's not like, uh, yes, brother, rub that in, okay? I'm going to look 16 tomorrow if that happens. So just some transparency with you, okay? Keeping it real. So what is he saying uh, that the elders should anoint our heads with oil? Well, uh, James was writing primarily to a Jewish Christian audience. They would have been immediately familiar with what he said. 
wasn't strange at all. See, in the Old Testament, anointing with oil was a way to set apart or dedicate something or someone to God. And so when he's saying, let the church leaders anoint you with oil, it's setting you apart for God's special attention in prayer. Saying, God, we're going to set this one apart. We're going to pray for the whole body of Christ, but right now, this person needs some grace. They're sick. And we're going to symbolically say, we're setting this person apart for prayer. And it focuses our prayer and our attention and our invitation for God's healing power to that person. Uh, Additionally, just as you feel the physical presence of oil on you, it's not supernatural. Oil ain't healing anybody. If someone on some funky religious TV show tries to sell you a vial of religious healing oil, don't buy it, okay? They got it from Hy-V, repackaged it, and they're scamming you. There's no healing power in the oil, but it's a reminder. Just as there's a physical presence of oil, so too, and in no less a real way, the physical presence and power of God is on your life when you pray, right? He is with you, and he is on you, and it is a reminder to you. And let me just say, it's one of my great joys and pleasures as a pastor to get to pray for people. I get to pray for people all the time. Uh, Thursday, I was writing this sermon, and uh, my friend came up, Randy, and said, would you pray for me? I said, ironically, I'm reading this passage, and I would love to pray for you. And we prayed for God to work in his life. Uh, I get to pray for all kinds of things. I get to pray for physical healing. Um, Just a few months ago, our dear friend Cynthia, who's a part of our church family, uh, she had struggled for literally decades with a chronic respiratory disease. Uh, She frequently would end up in the hospital because of complications from this chronic disease. And she was in the hospital. She had a pneumonia, some other complications from this chronic disease. And so she, in obedience to this, called the church office, said, I'm sick. Would you come and pray for me? So Tyler Zock had been a pastor for a week, and so we thought, send the new guy. (laughs) So Pastor Tyler goes over, not knowing what to do, uh, not knowing what to say, and maybe to his relief, she was asleep. So he thought, well, let me just pray. He quoted some verses. He just simply laid his hands on her and said, God, would you heal our dear sister, Cynthia? Shortly thereafter, Cynthia called the church office and said, I don't know what happened, but they've released me from the hospital, and not only were the complications no longer present, the hospital doctor wanted to know who my primary doctor was that diagnosed the respiratory disease in the first place because he said there's no sign that I ever had it. Cynthia is completely healed. You can clap for that. God heals. God heals. God healed her. Uh, Earlier this summer, our dear friend Jeannie uh, was sick. We didn't know with what, but she had been unable to eat more than a few bites for several weeks, and she was losing weight. She was losing energy. She was losing stamina. She had gone to several doctors, uh, and they were baffled. They tried multiple treatments with marginal to no success whatsoever. And it got to the point, Jeannie couldn't even come to church. She literally didn't have the physical strength to get out of bed, get in the car, and get here to church. She was sick. And so Chris and I, on a Wednesday morning, drove to West Omaha. We just prayed for Jeannie. Nothing fancy, no fancy ritual. We said, Jesus, we love Jeannie, and so do you. Would you heal her body? You love to give good gifts to your children. Would you give a good gift to Jeannie in healing? That next morning, she ate a large breakfast. She ate a large lunch. By Sunday, she was here with a pep in her step, and she came up and gave us a big hug on a Sunday morning. She said, God healed me. My strength is back. My appetite is back. I'm gaining weight. God has healed me. I called her on Friday just to make sure she was still doing okay before I quoted this. She said, the problem now is just keeping the weight off. You know, God has restored her health. God heals. Amen? God heals. You can clap for that. Now, does God always heal and always have to heal in the present? No, he doesn't, right? I'll never forget my first hospital visit. It didn't quite go like Tyler's. I was 25 years old, and uh, uh, an elderly woman in our church called into the church office, asked her pastor to come and pray. And so I went uh, and prayed with this gal. And her name was, well, I'll call her Helen. And I was really nervous to go in to pray with Helen. I had never done it before, so I found some comforting psalms in my Bible and prayed and full of faith. I went in. I shared some verses with the family. We prayed for Helen. I made it back out to my truck, and before my truck left the parking lot, Helen died. You know what that does for the confidence of a brand new pastor? Okay, I'm 0 for 1 on hospital visits. Like, she didn't just not get healed. She died like three minutes later, okay? 
I was ready to turn in my application to Best Buy and just throw in the towel. I mean, if you're looking for a confirmation from God on your calling, this will settle, unsettle your confidence a little bit, right? Um, now, God does heal in the present. He doesn't always heal in the present. But for the Christian, listen, even for Helen, God ultimately heal, heals. Look at verse 15. It says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Listen, for Helen, God didn't choose to heal her on this side of the grave, but is Helen healed today? Yes. Helen knew the Lord. Her faith was in Jesus. And guess what? She is healed. God answered those prayers in his timing and in his way and according to his will. It was Helen's turn to go home. She was old, ready to be with Jesus. And, and God said, yes, I'll heal her but this is how I'm going to heal her. And on that last day, Jesus will rise up her body and her soul will be reunited with her body as an embodied being and she will be healed fully in a body. Yes, Jesus heals. Sometimes he heals now, sometimes he heals in the future, but God answers those prayers. Amen? Amen. Look with me now at verse 16. He says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Okay, this is an interesting verse, isn't it? Let's talk about this. James seems to be making a connection between our sins and our sickness, between our confession and between our healing. Now, let me say this is a tricky verse, and if we misapply this verse, things get really weird really quick. And so let me unpack this. First, is sickness always caused by sin? No, not in the particular sense, right? Uh, in John chapter 9, the disciples bring a man who's born blind, uh, to Jesus. And they say, whose sin caused his blindness? Was it his or his parents? What does Jesus say? Neither. Right? It's not their sin. The dude was just born blind, right? And he was born blind so that I could heal him, he says. But he's saying there's not a direct parallel per se. And so I want you to know that sickness is in the world because of sin and brokenness in general, but you don't necessarily have a cold this week because you gossiped last week. Does that make sense? That's karma. That's not grace. That's not the way things work. God can, in special times and special circumstances, choose to discipline his children, to get our attention in certain times in certain ways. But just because you're sick doesn't mean you have sinned in particular. Sometimes we just get sick. It just happens. You break an arm, cancer comes, uh, the disease comes, we get a cold, we just get sick. Now, sometimes is sickness caused by sin? Sometimes, yes. Does sinful behavior taken to its end often end in sickness and death? Yes. When we are in sin, we are not living as God designed it. It's not congruent with the way our bodies are designed, and it can make us sick. And if we're harboring unrepentant, unconfessed sin, does it and can it affect our bodies? Yes. I think we tend to live like evangelical Gnostics, where we have this false dichotomy between the body and the soul. We think, I can do whatever I want in my soul. It doesn't affect my body. But listen, they're connected. God made us as embodied beings. We sin in our bodies. Our soul is in our bodies. They are together. One day we will live in eternity in resurrected bodies. We are beings in bodies. And what goes on in our mind and in our soul and in our conscious affects our bodies and vice versa. Um, and so I'll just give you an example. This week, this is another confession moment. I was just wrestling with anxiety. It was one of those weeks where you've got like four decisions to make and they all feel kind of weighty. Um, you've got like four conflicts you're working through pastorally with people in the church and they all feel kind of weighty. And I just had this weight and the sin was that I let that weight build up in me in anxiety. And in disobedience to James chapter 5, I was not prayerful this week. I was anxious. I let that anxiety and weight weigh on my shoulders, which was not a weight that I should be carrying. And I was sinfully anxious. And my anxiety builds up in my shoulders. Wednesday morning, before I come into the office, I'm thinking about a lot of kind of heavy things. I'm not praying. I'm thinking. And I'm tense. And I go to put shampoo in my hair. I pull a muscle in my back. You want to talk about embarrassing when I have to show up to the office like this, right? Someone says, how'd you hurt your back? Was it football? Was it basketball? Were you lifting weights? Uh, no, I was shampooing. <laughs> okay? I pulled a muscle shampooing. And so 
I could only turn my head about 30% of the way for two days. Why? Because of sin. My sin affected my body. Are we an embodied related being? Yes. Had a Christian doctor a number of years ago. Love this doctor. And I was waiting. I had the flu or something. Went in. And it took longer than usual for me to wait for him. And he finally came in and said, oh, knowing that I was a Christian, kind of confided in me. This last guy. I just had to tell him he was sick because of sin. I thought, what, what kind of doctor is this, you know? This is fantastic. He said, he's been coming in, he's got heart issues, he's got depression issues, he's got anxiety issues, and he wants all these medications, but he's told me that he's cheating on his wife. I just had to look this guy in the eye and say, listen, you don't need medicine, you need to repent of sin. You have heart problems and anxiety problems and depression problems because of sin. You need to repent of sin, right? Our souls affect our bodies. And the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, and confession matters. And what happens is when we're, sin, or when we're sick, we confess our sin, right? We pray that God would heal us, and we go to the doctor. We treat all of the whole body. We pray for the whole person. We treat the whole person. So he says, if you're, sin, confess your, or if you're sick, confess your sin, right? Maybe you don't need meds right now. You need to deal with your stuff before the Lord and confess, and you need to pray that you might be healed. Then, why do we pray? James is going to tell us, look at verse 16. He says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. That's key. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. We pray Because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful. I want you to know, as Chris, I think, read this morning, I was in the back talking out of 1 Peter, that our righteousness doesn't come from ourselves, it comes from Jesus. What he's saying is that when you are united with Jesus in faith, you have the very righteousness of Jesus in you. That gives you an access to God the Father, who is powerful through the person of Jesus. And when you pray, it's powerful because the very righteousness of God is in you. I think we don't communicate the power and the potential strength inside of the Christian near enough. I've said this before. I just said it last week in a sermon, but I have two pet peeves in preaching and communication from church leaders. One is that I think we aren't clear enough about the hopeless plight of a person apart from the grace of Jesus. And so we don't want to say, listen, unless you put your faith solely in the person work of Jesus, you are not only going to waste your life on this earth, you are going to throw your eternity away into a Christless and eternity in a place called hell. And so unless you turn to Jesus, it will not go well from you. There is a warning that we need to communicate, and in the church we're afraid to say it. It's not PC, it's not offensive. And so we just say, well, God wants you to have a little better life than you have right now. So have a little supplement of Christian religion and things are going to go well. No, it's not, okay? (laughs) We need Jesus or we are in trouble. There is judgment. There is righteousness. Now listen, my other pet peeve is when, for the person who has placed their faith in Jesus, that we stop short of communicating the fullness and greatness of their potential in God. So we tend to communicate like you're a really horrible sinner, and if you accept Jesus, he'll let you into heaven, but just barely, okay? So like, don't ask for anything else, you're pushing it. Just stay quiet and don't mess this up, okay? You got a good thing, don't ask for any more. Are you kidding me? The Bible says when your faith is in Jesus, yes, you're a worse sinner than you could ever imagine, but you are more forgiven and more enveloped in the love of God than you could ever imagine, He's put his Holy Spirit inside of you. The very righteousness of Christ is alive in you. You are the dwelling place of God on earth. Do you not think that he is, will, and will answer every prayer that you pray? Yes. Do you not have an access to God that gives you a strength, not in willpower, but in God power that's available to you that's limitless? Yes. And James says, the prayer of a righteous person, a Jesus person, is powerful in its working. And then he gives us a case study. He says, consider the man Elijah. Some of you are familiar with Elijah. He was a, an Old Testament prophet to the primarily Jewish Christian audience that James was writing to. They would have been very familiar with Elijah. God used him to do a number of miraculous things in the Old Testament. Very famous person in the Old Testament. And it says about um, Elijah in verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I love the way that he describes Elijah. 
He says, he was a man with a nature like ours. Let me translate that into modern vernacular. He's saying Elijah was just a dude, okay? He was a guy. As my friend Todd would say, he's regular, okay? He says regular because it sounds even more regular than regular, and he's from Waverly. And it's just as regular as you can get. He's saying Elijah is regular. He's a dude. He, he had a nature just like yours and like mine. He says, but he prayed that the rain would stop, and it did not rain for three years and six months. And then he prayed that it would rain. The heavens opened up. God brought the rain, and the land used, yielded its fruit once again. And the reason he says that Elijah is regular is because he wants you and me and his original audience to know that we have the same access to the same power in prayer that Elijah did, right? God answers prayers. God answers the prayers of regular people like you and like me. Do you believe that? I think uh, whether or not we truly believe that is demonstrated by the frequency and fervency of our prayers, if we believe that we have the same access that Elijah did that stopped the rain, we will be a people that will be nicknamed by our peers, old camel knees, right? Because we will cry out to God with such fervency, with such eagerness, such dependency, that it will cripple our knees prematurely. Because we believe, like Charles Spurgeon once said, that, that prayer is the slender hand that moves the omnipotent hand of God. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the hand of omnipotence. City Light, let me just say very simply, Sunday school style, God answers prayer. Amen. That's more than Christian religious platitude. That's a real power that's available to you and me. God answers prayer, and we have to believe that. The access that we have to God, the righteousness that we have through Jesus, uh, enables us to pray prayers that God will answer, and God always answers prayers. That said, sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's later, but God always answers our prayers. Now, I need to make a quick caveat, okay? Uh, what God is not, he is not a genie in a bottle who exists to make all of our wishes and whims and selfish desires come true, okay? So my single fellas, I don't know where you're at in the room, but if you're like unemployed, living in your parents' basement, you watch video games all day, don't own deodorant, and you need a haircut, but you're praying for like a bikini supermodel wife who has the Bible memorized and, and is like NASA smart and really godly, I don't think these prayers, I don't think that applies here, okay? Right? You might just need a haircut, a good job, memorize a couple verses, and then start praying that prayer, okay? Uh, God answers prayers according to his will, but what God does do in prayers, he starts to align our will with his will. As we communicate with God, we learn what he says yes to, what he says no to. He sometimes our prayers move the hand of God. Sometimes our prayer moves our will to align with God. And he disciples us as we listen to him. And we start to pray prayers that are in alignment with what he wants. And he gives us the joy of being the means through which his hand is moved. Through our prayers. God answers prayers. And for that reason, we pray for healing. We pray for each other. We pray for our church. We pray for our country. We pray for the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Iraq and in Syria and in Palestine and in Israel. We pray for the good of Omaha and the prosperity of the city that we love. We pray for the good of our own church and that God's kingdom would come here in City Light. Let us be a church that prays. I say this about every week, but I'm going to say it as long as you go to church here. City light is an answered prayer. I cannot communicate that enough. Before our little team of church planners stepped a foot in any direction to move to action, we prayed. We begged God that he would lead us. We begged God that he would save a whole hot mess of people. We prayed that God would provide for us. We asked for a building, and then we asked for a bigger building, and then we prayed that God would make his glory and fame uh, known in our city. And I want you to know that City Light, many people in this room know Jesus today because of those prayers. Many people in this room that you're sitting next to are married today and living with their children because of those prayers. Quite literally, this room exists today because of those prayers. And far be it from us that we would ever cruise. That's the danger now. Well, God got the ball rolling down the hill, and so uh, let's stop pushing forward in prayer and stop pushing forward as good leaders to maintain the organization and market this thing well. No, no, no. You know what happens when we stop pushing forward in prayer and we start pushing forward in willpower and our wisdom? We push it right off the cliff. That's where we push it, amen? And so we push forward in prayer. 
Very practically, I want you to know the commitment of your pastors and advisory team is to be prayerful. We're not going to bat a thousand, uh, but if you were here last week, uh, there was standing room only. And this is the nine, and I'm kind of scared that there's about 30 people standing in the back. And everyone's asking, your commitment's to multiply and to church plant, and, and uh, you're going to order more chairs, and what are you going to do? We're out of space, and you got to, here's our commitment. We're going to pray. And we have been praying. And what's our next step? I'll be real transparent. We don't know, okay? Nothing's off the table, but here's our commitment. We are dialing into Jesus and asking, what is your plan? What is your will? What are your next steps? Because so far, this whole strategy of praying has worked pretty well. Far be it from us that we would switch our strategy now to some sort of model. Amen? Amen. So we are going to pray. Last verses of the whole book. Buckle up. Home, Home stretch here. Verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I love how Pastor James ends his letter. As the pastor of these churches, of these people that he loves, his final concern is for those who have wandered. He has the heart of a pastor and a heart that loves people because pastors and churches should love people, should be all about people. And when people wander, we should care. And it's all about God, but God loves people, okay? And so it needs to be about God first, and then it needs to be about people. And he says, when people wander, that matters. Love his heart in this. May it be our heart. I want you to know that word wanders, um, that's a, or wanders from the truth is, is kind of a, a generic phrase that doesn't apply only to Christian doctrine in the narrow sense, but to the broader sense of all that's assumed in the gospel, And so to wander from the truth might mean to join the funny cult when they show up with the poorly illustrated watercolor pamphlets, right? You know what I'm talking about. Why is their graphic design so bad? It just screams cult, okay? (laughs) If you see the watercolors, just run, okay? It's a cult. And so that could be what he means from wander to the truth. It also could mean just to get off step. To wander from Christian community, to start to invest and pour your life into your career, to make that your idol, or pour it into video games, or neglect your family. He's saying to wander from the truth, to wander from the theology and practical living of the Christian life. And he says when someone wanders, we need to go after them, right? We need to go after them. And he says when we do, we will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins, Uh, Let me answer very briefly the question that I think for about 10% of the people in the room, that question arises, can we lose our salvation, right? What do you mean? If someone wanders, you need to go save their soul and cover their sins. If they were a Christian, aren't they, right? And we start to ask all kinds of questions of the text that I believe the text isn't trying to answer. And so I don't want us to read into the text a question it's trying to answer, That being said, since I opened the can, let me say, I believe um, the question, I've said it before, can we lose our salvation is the wrong question to ask. The better question is, does God ever lose a child? The answer is no. Uh, Okay, I've got three kids, far be it for me to lose one, and God is a much better father than me. And so he is the one who saves, he is the one who perseveres, he is the one pursues, but very simply, I think James is saying that God often uses the caring, loving, thoughtful, kind people of God in the church to persevere his saints by coming gently around someone and says, brother, you've wandered. You need to come back with grace and truth to say, you're off in left field. You're missing it. I care. God loves you. Would you come back? Right? Let me say this. I I want us to apply this very practically by asking for your help in doing this. Okay, City Light's been an adventure. We've been running downhill for 18 months, and it's been like drinking energy shots every day, you know, and it's just been wild. And uh, 18 months ago, we were a handful of families in an old church basement that smelled like must eating breakfast. Last week, there were over 1,200 people here a year and a half later. And that's awesome, that's amazing, and that's very dangerous, okay? Can I just name that elephant in the room? That can be very scary because things that grow very quick sometimes don't have the infrastructure to maintain health. And I think we're in a great danger in a number of areas, not the least of which is that someone can come in and come out and never get discipled, never get noticed. A year ago, if someone was wandering, we would find out, right? If someone just quit showing up, we would at least notice. If someone was struggling, we would hear about it and know. And now I'm embarrassed to say that this morning, 
This morning, I met like three new people, said, how long have you been coming? They said, four months. <laughs> Someone else said, I don't know, five, six months. I've never even met you. I'll just be transparent. I wouldn't know if you wandered because I didn't know you were here. And that scares me. I think I'm a horrible pastor, okay? Am I a pastor? Am I a speaker, right? I don't like that. But listen, what I think James is saying here is that the responsibility is not just the pastors. Who's it for? The whole church. Look at verse 19 again. How does he start it? Dear pastors, what's he say? Dear brothers, he's talking to the church, the men and women of God in the church saying this is our responsibility. This is our responsibility as a church. And I want you to know the pastors are in this game too. Every Wednesday, uh, we devote one whole hour to prayer for our church and community. We pray more than that, I hope, but that's our dedicated 8.30 to 9.30 prayer. And this week, all we did is pray for people that we could think of that have wandered, that have been MIA. And I'm sad to report we had a lot of names. We filled up the whole hour, no problem. And then we wrote handwritten note cards that said, we prayed for you, we care about you, we love you, and you're missed. Love, Pastor Gavin. That's what we did. But we didn't hit everyone. And I want to invite you. Is there someone, very practically, you might think, you know what? Sally used to be here every week. Come to think of it, she had mentioned her financial struggle, her marital struggles, her struggles with her kids, and I haven't seen her in months. Would you call Sally? Would you let her know that God cares and you noticed? Would you extend grace? Would you pray for her? Maybe Mike came consistently to your city group for months, and come to think of it, we haven't seen Mike since May. Where is Mike? Would you let Mike know that you care for him, that you notice? Would you pray for him? Would you go after the person who has wandered? In City Life, isn't this what Jesus did for us? Isn't this the gospel that we have all believed? That we were the wayward one, that we were the wanderer, and Jesus came down, God incarnate, to pursue us and to save us and to bring us back. Some of us didn't even know that we were lost. We didn't even know that we were dead in our sins, and Jesus pursued us and wanderers, and he brought us back. And we first need to understand that we have been on the receiving end of the loving pursuit of Jesus, and in response, we pursue those who have wandered, and we bring them back to the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop preaching. Here's how we're going to respond this morning. I want to respond very practically as doers by praying. So Gabe and the band are going to come up. You guys can come up now. Uh, In obedience to chapter 5, verse 13, we're going to sing praise. We're going to worship Jesus. If there's cheer in your heart, uh, tell your face, smile, and worship God. We can be a happy church because Jesus makes us happy. And so if any of you is cheerful, let you sing praise with gladness. Raise your hands and worship Jesus. Some of you are suffering. We'd like to pray with you. Uh, We're going to have a whole team of staff, prayer volunteers, pastors in the back. If some of you are suffering, would you come back? As we often do, we're just going to invite God uh, to work in your life. We want to minister to you, invite the Holy Spirit to work in you. Some of you are sick. You are physically sick. God might heal you. He might not, but he might, right? And what if he does? And so our pastors are going to be in the back with anointing oil. We want to anoint and pray in obedience to James chapter 5, verse 13. And so let me pray, and then we will sing praise, and then we will pray in the back. We'd invite you to come. Jesus, we thank you that you are a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You understand our suffering. So too, for eternity, you have experienced the joy of fellowship with the triune God, and you are a God of great joy. And the whole range of emotion you have experienced, and you are a God who understands our joy and who understands our grief, and you are near, and you are able, and your Holy Spirit is present. And you not only want to fellowship with us, comfort us, lead us, we believe, God, that for many people you would choose to heal us. And so, God, um, uh, we're not healers. We don't have great power. No one's going to fall over backwards this morning because I push them down out of strength. Very simply, as your children, we want to ask that you would move and heal this morning. We want to invite you, and God, if you would will it, would you heal some? Some who are broken, who are grieving, would you minister to them in a very personal and a very powerful way? way. We pray, God, that you would come and move and work among us through the power of Jesus that we pray. Amen.